Welcome back, sword friends. Today we're taking a look at the Pavel Mach Kriegsmesser. Welcome back. I have a riddle for you guys. What do you get when you have an overzealous girlfriend with a rather lesbianic gift-giving style? Weapons! You get a European katana. Seriously guys, stop calling this that. It's not that. It's a very different sword. This is a Kriegsmesser made by swordsmith Pavel Mach from the Czech Republic and it was commissioned by my girlfriend for our one year anniversary and it has to be one of my favorite swords in my collection. It is definitely my favorite European style blade that I own. It's not just because it was a gift, it's an awesome sword. But before we get into that, let's talk about what a Kriegsmesser is. A Kriegsmesser is Typically a two-handed, slightly or very curved blade um, with a sandwiched style knife hilt. They were used from the 1300s to about 1500, maybe a little after as well. Now the word Kriegsmesser means war knife, and that is in contrast to its younger brother, the Langmesser, usually a one-handed sword, but both share the same style of grip usually a sandwiched knife style grip with wood slabs. And that is in contrast to the encased grip style of arming swords and long swords of the medieval era. The long sword here has a tang that goes on the inside of the grip, it's fully encased, while the Kriegsmesser is slab sided. The walnut grips right here are only on the sides with the tang being exposed. Now the Kriegsmesser is definitely more of a battlefield weapon than the Langmesser. This one is an example from Lands Connect Emporium. This is their Gottfried Messer. We have a review on that as well. Now the shorter Langmesser was carried by a large variety of different people. That could be a civilian, merchant, uh, someone in town. It was also carried by soldiers as well. But a Kriegsmesser was specifically designed for war, hence the name Krieg. They were typically used two-handed, but there are many uh, depictions of them being used one-handed as well. And I would compare the size of this Kriegsmesser to that more of a hand and a half or a bastard sword than a long sword. And you can see the length difference here on this uh, Dark Sword Armory long sword. Let's see if I can get the length difference demonstrated in the video. So you can see that the Kriegsmesser is a few inches shorter than the long sword. And even on the grip, it's just slightly shorter than the long sword with the extended fishtail pommel. Now, long swords, arming swords, and bastard swords have a typology that helps define them called the oak shot typology. Messers have something similar called the Elmsley typology, and it helps us classify these different kinds of blades because there were a lot of different kinds of messers and different shapes. You can see differences between this Langmesser and this Kriegsmesser in blade shape. And things like curvature and blade size all varied with messers. There are many examples of Kriegsmessers that have a much larger and thicker tip here for cutting through tougher targets. Whereas this one is kind of a medium sized one that tapers off to a, a fine point. Now when I had this commissioned, I wanted some custom work done on the tip shape because the standard Kriegsmesser that Pavel Mach makes is thicker up top. And I wanted something that was a little more acute at the end, uh, something that you would typically see in like a Type 18 sword uh, meant to go through mail and armor. But I also wanted a, uh, the false edge to be slightly sharpened. I'll go into the, the sharpness of this blade in just a bit, but I wanted this to actually have an edge on the back because I train in longsword and I wanted something that I could use the same longsword techniques that I do with something like this. Now, as you can see on this Kriegsmesser, this blade shape is slightly curved. There were messers that were more curved than this and there were messers that were straighter. Again, a good example is the Lance Connect Emporium Gottfried. This is a much straighter blade than the curved Havel Mach example. The curvature and general shape of Kriegsmessers has lent to the opinion that they are basically European katanas. And as a Kenjutsu instructor, uh, guys, it's not the same thing as a katana. It doesn't feel the same. It does look the same, and I will admit, that's what attracted me to this style of blade. I wanted a longsword and a katana. The best of both worlds, a longsword, but a katana. 
and I came to this conclusion because I love the handguard, the longsword style handguard with the ring guard. It's a superior handguard system to the katana. The feeling of how this sword performs uh, doesn't feel one to one to a katana. First of all, it's a lot thinner than a katana's blade and it flexes, unlike a katana's blade, which is usually very, very stiff. Now, typically Krieg's messers, just like all messers, all were single edged, but there were many examples of the back edge, the false edge, being sharpened. I had Lance Connect Emporium sharpen the back edge of their Godfrey, and uh, it's razor sharp, it cuts through everything. When it comes to messers, a big question always comes up. Why did these two types of swords exist at the same time? The first of the two most popular theories I've seen floating around, citizens in some places were not allowed to carry swords like this. This was their way of skirting the law because they're just carrying a big knife at this point. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm sure in some places it might've been, but honestly, someone could look at this and go, hey man, that's, that's a sword, that ain't a knife. The other theory that I've seen floating around is the guild theory, that some guilds made these kinds of swords and some guilds made these kinds of swords. And that could have been an aesthetic thing where, hey, we make this new thing, you should check it out. And they say it's whatever, it's more durable or it's cheaper to make. I'm not sure. But I will say that a Kriegsmesser typically is easier to make than a long sword or an arming sword because there's less material. There's nothing to wrap. You're basically creating a slab and a slab and bolting them onto the sword, the tang itself, and the blade being single-edged costs less to sharpen, costs less to uh, create the bevels, the time it takes to actually grind those bevels down, is probably gonna be less than a long sword. And in many examples of Kriegsmessers I've seen, it is not this ornate. Now take whatever I'm saying with a grain of salt, guys, because honestly, I don't know. I'm not a historian, I'm a practitioner, and I am at the mercy of what I study and read online. And these are just some of the theories that kind of make sense to me and that I juggle around in my head. These swords are probably made most famous by the Landsknecht, German and Swiss mercenaries from the medieval to the Renaissance period. We see examples in artwork and wood cutouts of uh, Landsknecht, probably from their earlier periods, wearing these on their sides. And uh, they were probably replaced by the Katzbulger later on because I see more of those than I do of these later. Let's take a look at the beautiful aesthetics of this sword. The craftsmanship on this blade is phenomenal. I just love the way it looks. It gives me strong endgame vibes. Like this is a sword you pick up from like a boss you fought or something. It just looks so unique. It doesn't look like any kind of standard sword out there. I asked for black walnut grips as Pavel will do different types of wood styles. And uh, I was so happy that he was able to actually do the black walnut and man, it just, the quillons on the cross guard twist into these gold and silver roses or these flowers at the end. I think it's just so unique looking. Now in place of what is called the noggle, you have a ring guard right here. There are many examples of Kriegsmessers with a traditional noggle, which means nail, and you can see it here on my Lance Connect Emporium sword. And it is just an, an additional piece of metal to protect your hand from people sliding down and hitting your hand, or even just striking and getting a lucky shot on your knuckles. I find that the ring guard is a superior option to the standard noggle, and it's because to strike my hand you have to find a way to get around this, the entire circumference of this ring, whereas a standard noggle or nail, all of that can still be hit on this side. If you get, if you get a lucky shot or you come up like that and it goes to this little corner right here, there's a chance that if I don't maneuver the noggle over there in time, that you're gonna hit my hand. The ring guard also allows me to do a thumbs up grip, which you typically find in longsword, whereas the noggle, it really isn't gonna let you do that, right? It rests right there. I can put my thumb around it if I need to, but now my thumb is very exposed, more so than with the ring. The blade is fullered about three fourths down. Now on Messers, I am a big fan of the bird's beak style pommel. And both the Pavel Mach Kriegsmesser and my Lands Connect Emporium have that style of pommel and that's, I just like it because my hand won't slide off and honestly, it just looks cool. Now this sword comes with an amazing looking scabbard. 
all the way through, it is, it's just beautiful. It has these Latin verses on them, which I think are from uh, the Bible. So they're, they're in Latin. Uh, that's his tradition. He puts those on there. Um, I think it's pretty cool. I don't know what they mean. I have to go and translate them. Uh, and overall, it's a quality made leather scabbard with a wood core. And when you sheathe, there is tension near the end of the blade. So here, it stops there and it clicks in. This makes it hold relatively well. If you hold it upside down long enough, it will slide out. Like you'll start seeing it start coming out slowly. But see, it's not that bad. I have to shake it. And even then, it's not really coming out, right? I still have to pull. So this scabbard was made for this sword, which I think is great. I love the line work. All of the line work on it on the front of the scabbard is very, very nice. I will say that the, uh, the leather on the scabbard came a little ashy, but I put a little oil on it and it shined up pretty nice. Now the back side of the scabbard is where I have some issue. Even though it is well put together, there is a seam line on the leather that has been uh, either sewn or I think it's glued with like a leather glue of some kind. And it looks a little patchy. It's like patchworky. This sword is gonna be carried blade down. So no one's ever gonna see that side of things. But for the amount of money that you pay for this sword, I would have expected to see a tiny bit more work put on this right here. But honestly, this is probably historical. This is probably what you would get when you would buy a Kriegsmesser in medieval times. Now you can get a suspension system with this sword. It costs a little bit extra and it is a, uh, like it is a full on belt that has a two, uh, two piece suspension system. I opted not to use it because my belt has a sword frog already. Not the most historical sword frog ever, but this sets my sword at the perfect angle for carry for me. The gap between the cross guard and the blade itself, I think is pretty good. It's not super wide, but I think because of the way the blade is shaped, being single edged, it's going to have some form of a gap near the edge but it does look like this cross guard was made for this blade. So I'm not really upset about that. Now the Kriegsmesser is weighted in a way that there is a lot of weight at the end of the pommel, very similar to what you would find on a long sword. And they do that from what I can tell by welding this larger, thicker piece of steel onto the tang. It's heavy enough that if you decide to murder bonk your opponent, you're probably gonna do some significant damage, especially with that protruding beak. According to my scale, this sword weighs about three pounds, two ounces. It has noticeable distal taper starting from the Ricasso at about six millimeters, going down to the tip at 2.4 millimeters. That's also another element that probably gives this blade its lively feel is it has a pretty drastic taper from the six millimeter down to the two. This Kriegsmesser was based on a museum piece that was found. And from what I understand, the museum piece is a bit thicker. So historically, it was probably a little heavier and a little thicker than this one. I think they said that the uh, starting taper was at around eight millimeters. So it was a lot bigger than this one. But I'm not really slamming this thing through armor, so I actually really appreciate how maneuverable and light it is. The more historical example with a thicker tip was probably used for more percussive force on armored opponents. Whereas this one, I'm cutting through tatami and bottles and different things like that, and I want it to feel fast in the hand. This particular sword is made out of 5160 high carbon steel, which is very typical of European style blades. Um, it has Good flex, it is more flexible than my Type 18 longsword up here, but it's not super flexible. So the big question is, how does one fight with a Kriegsmesser? The short answer, no one really knows. I personally have been using the longsword techniques that I know into Kriegsmesser and it does transfer well, but when reading up on it, there really isn't any surviving manuals on how to use a Kriegsmesser. And maybe that's because that was lost the time, or in reality, they just realized that, hey, if you know how to use a longsword or if the information to learn how to use a longsword is already out there, you're just gonna transfer it into this thing. All of my Lichtenauer and Fiori techniques seem to work well with this sword. My thumbs up grip works really well for uh, the, the Sverk and all these other techniques, the Krumpau. I can do all of that with this sword. 
Because the quillons are about as long as a longsword's quillons, the same techniques for blocking and, and cutting at the same time, all of your Meisterhaus, they also work with this sword. So as long as this weapon is, you would think that this is only a two-handed weapon, but the way that it's balanced, it actually works really well as a one-handed weapon, which is why I think it's closer to what we would call a bastard or hand and a half sword than a dedicated two-handed sword. The point of balance is further back than my dark sword armory longsword back there, which is about five inches. This is like three and a half. So it feels very light in the hand to the point where I can do it one-handed and it doesn't really tire me out. Now, little caveat, it is never going to feel as nimble as a dedicated one-handed sword like this uh, Lands Connect and Boring one. This feels superb in the hand. I can move it, I can stop it on a dime, and it doesn't tire my arm out to use. But we see artwork and mention of these swords, Kriegsmessers, being used with small target shields, uh, or also called hand pavise or pavis. I, I don't really know how it's pronounced. But these were mentioned in literature being used with small hand shields. And I'm, I'm gonna demonstrate that later on to show you that it can be used with a buckler or a small shield. Now, if you're like me and you're very interested in knowing more about how these swords were used, go over to Lands Connect Emporium's Kriegsmesser page because they have a wealth of information on how these swords were probably used, uh, including their own experimentation with video and also links to studies and literature that uh, talk more about these swords. They are considered to be one of the foremost experts in modern reproductions of Messers. So it makes complete sense that they probably have more information on this than anyone else. Check out their page, I'll link it in the description. So how does this sword handle? Like a dream. With two hands, this sword feels way lighter than any long sword I own. I feel it is just super maneuverable. It's fast in the hands. I can re-index the point extremely quickly. And most importantly, I don't feel fatigued after training with a sword for over an hour. This sword was so maneuverable that my girlfriend who bought this sword for me, who usually uses a single-handed Langmesser, was able to do techniques with it and not feel overly fatigued. It's a very maneuverable sword, one-handed as well. I can move it around, I can block with it. I don't feel like I'm swinging around a great weight, and I don't feel super fatigued after I'm done. Now, like I said before, guys, this sword is never going to replace an arming sword or a Langmesser in terms of one-handed use and maneuverability, but it can be used one-handed, making this sword extremely versatile. Now, weapons are about compromise. There is no such thing as a perfect weapon. If you want one thing, you have to sacrifice the other. This sword just happens to meet in the middle for a lot of different criteria. Now, I had mentioned this sword being used with bucklers and hand shields, so I wanted to put that to the test. So I whipped out one of my steel bucklers and went to work. This sword is capable of being used with the buckler. It's not going to feel as fast and maneuverable together as you would a dedicated one-handed sword, just like when I was using it without the buckler but I can tell that this sword is still very effective with a shield. I'm very curious to see if this sword will work better with a bigger shield, like a, I don't know, like a big uh, heater shield of some kind. Um, I don't know if they were ever used together. I don't think they were, but the hand pavise or pavises, whatever they're called, uh, they are more angular uh, in shape than the uh, than round bucklers were. So how does this sword cut? Spoiler alert, better than all of these. So let me put that into perspective. This is not the sharpest European sword I own. That goes to the Lands Connect Emporium. It's probably the dullest, but guys, it cuts through everything. I can put minimal force into cuts, one-handed or two-handed, and it just goes right through. Now other thicker bottles like the water bottles and detergent bottles, same thing. I was able to cut a detergent bottle without the bottom even leaving the stand. And I had to break out the Olive Garden salad dressing bottle because you know, when you're here, you're family.
Zesty. And a Ludus Ferozia sword review would not be complete without cutting through a big protein bar. The thing I like about milk jugs, aside from being insanely satisfying to cut, is you can actually track your edge alignment even though you're cutting all the way through. You can see me get a mouth of sour milk there. Really gross. Next, I tried doing multiple cuts on the same target, and this is one of the best swords I own for this. I'm able to realign and cut with relative ease on one target. As you can see, I'm getting three cuts on most of these targets. That's so crazy. <laughs> oh my God. Now for a weapon that isn't the sharpest sword in my collection, I thought this was going to send some of the targets flying even if they cut through. But as you can see, most of them are staying on the stand after I cut them. It allows me to get up to three cuts. Now as you can tell on this last one, I actually get to have four cuts. And that very last one is just a tiny little sliver of a target. Now I did do some light torture testing on the blade like we do with all of our blades. I'm not doing anything too crazy where I'm trying to destroy it but I did slam this blade into a pine block, very similar to what we did with the DSA longsword, and I do not have any deformation on the blade, no rolls, no nothing I have to file out. So let's talk about some things that I do not really care for on this blade. I talked about a lot of things I love, but there are a few things that I think need some work. And the very first thing is the edge. The edge has a very obvious secondary bevel and it came okay sharp. I'm not fond of the secondary bevel that just is just glaring at me every time I see this. With a true apple seed geometry, this blade would be phenomenal, like 10 out of 10. The back edge, the short edge right here, barely came sharp at all. In fact, when I show you the cutting that I did with this, it's pathetic, it didn't cut well at all. I did miss the target in one and hit the, uh, the stand, but even when I did hit the target, it, it would not clear the target. So this, I'm gonna have to re, I'm gonna have to get this sharpened by our local guy, and then I am gonna have a true apple seed bevel put onto this when it's resharpened. There were some other things I didn't like as well. I see a lot of what I assume is epoxy, uh, that is, or it might be wood glue, epoxy, or wood filler that is filling gaps with the grip and the metal, meaning uh, that these grips were probably not made exact to the metal itself. Um, it isn't really apparent, but it does look kind of ugly when you look close enough to see it. Now, if you plan to make an order with Pavel Mop, understand that there's going to be some lapse in communication because honestly, I think he's just a really busy guy. I check out his Facebook every now and then. We communicated mainly through email when he was asking what I wanted out of this blade. It, it took sometimes a week for him to reply, but when you look at his page, he's making batches of weapons. So to make a custom weapon, it's gonna take him a little time to get around to it with his workload. Now, Pavel spoke English pretty well. There was a little bit of a difference in translation, I think, but if you are extremely detailed in what you want in the sword, he's able to make it. Overall, my experience shopping with him was very positive and he delivered exactly what I wanted. So overall, do I think it's worth your money? Yes, 100%. When this was purchased by my girlfriend, I believe with shipping and import tax and all that stuff, I think it came out to around like high 800s or maybe low 900s. I don't know the exact price because again, it was a gift. Um, I think for that amount of money, this sword is is worth it. You get a sword that just 
it just performs better than any of the production swords that I have. It looks great, and aside from small cosmetic details, it's a sword that just cuts so well and looks just as good as it cuts. That price does include the scabbard. If you decide not to buy the scabbard, I think this, it comes down quite a bit. It comes down to like 700, probably closer to like six before shipping, depending on where you live. Uh, it's 700 to ship to the United States, uh, to the East Coast. But with the scabbard, it was like another 150, $200 is what I assume, I'm not sure, but which is very typical of European style blades. It's also gonna look extremely good when you throw it up on your wall or when you show it to your friends. You get to feel like you killed a video game boss and stole his loot, or that this is some crazy ancestral blade that's been passed down through your family. It just looks so cool. It handles extremely well, eerily so for a blade this big, and it's handmade by a well-known smith. Now, I don't have a more expensive Kriegsmesser to compare this to. I would love to get my hands on a, uh, an Albion Connect, but uh, for now, this is my absolute favorite European blade in my collection. I don't think you're gonna go wrong with it if you decide to go with Pavel Mach, because he makes a whole lot of other blades too. Guys, if you liked that review and you wanna see more, consider supporting us by murder bonking that subscribe button, liking, and commenting on this video. It really, really helps us out. I'm really excited to do more reviews in the future. We have so many swords and pieces of equipment I wanna go over. I just don't have enough hours in the day to get it all done. And if you learned nothing else from this video, remember, guys, get yourself a girl that gives you swords. See you next time. Don't you want